So, Jay, do you notice that in Slack, amongst the pinned items, you'll see the classroom resources. Oh, okay, okay. So if you go to the classroom resources, you will find all this. Right? Uh, all of the videos and everything is itemized here. Oh. Even the book right, is uh, there, the latest version of the book. It is at this moment a Google share because the book, I'm updating the book almost every day. Every okay, day. okay, okay, okay. It's a big evolving book. Right. So um, actually, let me try and talk from the, the book sections itself. First, I'm just take the Facebook network. So, all right, guys. Huh? This is this one network is called something called the ego network. What are ego networks? Suppose I want to find out who are the what is your network, a person's network. I see the I screen. Take the person as a central node, and I take all the links coming out of the person who are they related to, and you can go a couple of steps beyond that. But certainly, those people are related to the core person. And you can see that this guy is related to every single guy in the network. It's an ego network. Yeah, as of, right. oh, as if we can't see you. Yeah, we can't see anything. Oh, I apologize. Maybe it's in a different window. Yes, I don't know. So I think I stopped. Screen stopped sharing. Can you see it again? Uh, yes. Yeah, OK. So one of the. Uh, one of the popular networks that you see, of course, social graphs, is Facebook. In Facebook, if you look at the entire graph of Facebook, who is connected to whom, who is friends with whom, you realize that there are three and a half, four billion nodes there. So it will be a very huge network. We live in the world of such giant social networks. But here, in this particular data, what you see is a small subset. You have taken about seven people. And we are looking at what is called the ego network. Ego network means uh, the people who are connected to these seven people. And you can see the effect, the ego aspect of it. Like, for example, this guy is connected to everybody here. You see this? <coughs> this guy is connected to everybody here. But the interesting thing is when you have a network like this, ego network, Obviously, the structure is quite apparent. What is interesting is like uh, how many people are connected to a node. The number of people connected to a node, the number of edges, is called the degree of a node. And degree is a very simple uh, sort of a indicator of node's importance or influence. Right? Uh, in, in, in LinkedIn, for example, people make a big deal that their network is so big. At the beginning of the career, the people straight out of college will have a single digits or two digit networks. You know? And then as we get older and older, we end up getting hundreds and sometimes thousands. Sometimes uh, uh, I heard one, somebody who said has 10,000. And if you go to the celebrities, the Bill Gates and these people, they have their network, I would imagine, are, using, are in millions. So it gives you an idea if you just order all the people by their uh, the size of the edges, the number of connections they have, which is called the degree. You can see who are the most influential people. Now, in real networks, there is something very interesting that was observed um, by Barabasi in the late 1990s. And it turns out that it was an observation made by yet another mathematician in the 1960s called price, but uh, it was sort of forgotten and not taken that seriously at that time, and essentially rediscovered by Baravasi Albert. And it led to a regeneration of interest, massive interest in networks. So um, it is this, you see the degrees, the colors, the things that are deeply colored are high degree nodes. So you can clearly see that these are highly influential uh, nodes that you can do. And when you do the degree distribution, how many nodes have degree was zero, one? Thousands of nodes here have degree one, right? Very low degree. How many of them have high number of degrees? Let's say in hundreds. You can see that very, very few. Can you guys see that, right? And this scale goes out to 1,000, which means that there must be some data point here, which presumably, if you look at this particular uh, node here, the dark maroon node, probably has a degree in thousands. We can check actually with code. 
uh, what is the highest degree in this particular graph. So that is a measure of centrality, the right, importance of that node. Now, when you study networks as complex graphs, and we are surrounded by complex graphs everywhere, you know, power networks, social networks, uh, biological systems, it turns out, are very complex networks. The human brain, the cat brain, all of these, the interactions which between the neurons are all networks. <coughs> so the question is, the first time you encounter a network, it's sort of hard to make out what is it, because it just looks like a, a big spaghetti jumble of uh, nodes connected to each other. And it's hard to make sense out of it. Yet, if you just look qualitatively, you can see some difference. Like, for example, if you look at this network, it looks different from this network, which is the network of Enron uh, emails between employees. Uh, clearly, this is a more sort of a central structure to it. Right. And this is different from, let me take another, this is the human disease or zone. What it is, what it is, is uh, all the nodes are diseases and two diseases are connected to each other. If you can implicate a common gene as either causative or somehow contributory to those two illnesses. So once you, and this looks quite different, I hope you guys are seeing. And if you look at the a brain, for example, cat brain network. Let me try another one. Um, here it is. Now look at this uh, small network of certain cat brain activity. What do you notice? All the nodes are more or less interconnected. There's a very high degree of cohesion in this network, isn't it? So now you ask yourself, visually you can see that they are different, qualitatively different. But how can I be more precise, more quantitative about the networks? How can we, in other words, describe the networks mathematically and quantitatively? So one can think of very simple measures. One is you just count the number of nodes. And how many nodes are there? That is one. Then the other thing you can do is you can count the number of edges. Now, you ask yourself, what do the number of edges tell about a, a network in itself? Nodes just tell how big the network is. Edges tell how, how interconnected the nodes are. So for example, if there are no edges and all you have are nodes, it's hardly a network, right? It's a, it's a degenerate case of a lot of nodes standing apart. On the other hand, if every node is connected to every other node, then it becomes what you call a and uh, collect it. So let's take a few illustrative networks here. I'll do that. Um, where, where am I? This is the, okay. Uh, if you take, for example, a network, which is made up of where every node is connected to every node, you realize that there would be gazillions of interconnect. Here I've taken only 50 nodes, you know, those, dots along the edges. But if you connect each node to every other node, you can't even see the edges. It begins to look more like an abstract art. Why? Because the number of edges grows quadratically with the number of nodes, isn't it? So real networks are not so dense. This is a completely dense network. It is called a complete network. Right? It is a complete network means there is no edge left that you can add to the system. All the edges are present. So sometimes you do find uh, complete networks in existence. Right? For example, if you take a small team, a pod of five, six developers who are all busy doing a project. And if you look at the email exchange or message exchange between them, you realize that uh, if it is a healthy team, then every member of the team has been talking to every other member, isn't it? And so the graph you'll end up drawing is something like this. It's a complete network. So complete network, uh, and, and you can see one reason we don't have very large teams is because uh, by the time you reach a 50 team situation, it is, it is very hard to ensure that everybody is talking to everybody else because the sheer amount of email traffic that will be going is huge. And so what will happen is the network will sort of, uh, fracture will partition it, itself into sub-networks, smaller groups of people talking to each other. 
isn't it? And they'll sort of become, they're like pots, and which is why in engineering we use pots these days, optimal sizes between five and seven or something like that, most people use, because that is the level at which complete graphs uh, survive. They do well. So this is one nature of a graph. You can have another kind of a graph like this one. Um, let's go here. So what does this say? This is a very interesting graph. Everybody is connected to the central guy, the star in the big, in the center, right? And but the all those people on the other nodes and are not connected to each other. They are not talking to each other at all. Right? It's a hub and spokes model. It's a very interesting uh, formation. Sometimes uh, it it works. I can't think. Maybe there are some practical situations where I suppose this may be true. Uh, I suppose a taxi. Uh, uh, a taxi company and the dispatcher would be something like that. If you think of all these nodes as taxi drivers, when they are working, who do they talk to to get customers or to inform where they are going and so forth? They talk to the dispatcher in the center. Okay. So this is the communication network between taxi drivers and dispatchers. Uh, this would be one example of that. And uh, <clears throat> so like that, we, we have to learn to recognize networks this is something called a binomial network you know people with a certain probability are maybe interconnected with each other right? and if you look at the degree distribution of uh, like there may be a couple of nodes which are highly important there's some uh, <clears throat> who are who have less connections and less connections and so forth so one can mathematically think of many such networks and these are the classic shapes of networks that you can do. Another is the wheel network. It looks like the star network, except that you also have connection between nodes and their neighbors, not just to the hub. Right? But then you have another form of network, which is quite interesting. Uh, let me just show this network in a single page. <clears throat> this network is what is called cliques. Cliques are an important thing you study in network, complex network analysis. Cliques are people who are all completely connected to each other. Do you notice that? Do you see this cluster of things? Maybe I can make this bigger. If you look at uh, any one cluster, do you see that all of them are interconnected to each other? Right? They're like families or cliques. And then the cliques, and then there, there's cross clique connections also there, right? So the network is sort of a daisy chain of cliques. And in like it's a simple theoretical position, but you do find cliques in networks quite a lot, and we'll come to that. It, the idea is that by studying these, we develop some intuition on what to look for in uh, networks. So now let's get back to our situation. We realize so these are theoretical ideas that yes, you can do that. Right? Then when people were studying networks, they realized that. Uh, you could, where am I? Random geometric graph work using eye graph using network. Maybe uh, illustrative networks. Is this the one? Yeah. So this, these are real networks. For example, this is the Zakari Karate Club, in which these are all members of the Karate Club. There are enough members, they are about 28 or something like that, that you realize that they are not likely to be. Uh, all talking to each other. So when you look at this network, you know that it is sort of ripe for fracturing into smaller networks. And it did. If you look at this, the the a person number 33 and 32, especially 33, is a very high influence individual. And the person zero is a high influence individual. So it is possible that this uh, group, this club may fracture into two pieces, two sub networks, Around, centered around 33 and zero. And indeed, that's what happened in uh, the, history, the history of this uh, Zakari Karate Club is that group did, manage, did fracture into two pieces. Right? So you can study human interactions. You can predict things by looking at network that what may or may not happen. Now, this uh, person, uh, Erdos, the great mathematician in the uh, 50s, he made a 57, I believe, he wrote a paper in which he said, Erdos and Rengi, they wrote a paper saying that one way to think of graphs is just put n nodes on a page 
and then have a certain probability that they, any one node will be connected to any other node, right? So here it is, a 5% probability. 200 nodes, 5% probability of a node being connected to some other node, right? <clears throat> and so you end up with this rather highly interconnected network. This network, if you look at the degree distribution, do you see that it sort of has a binomial distribution or binomial sort of looks like a discrete bell curve? Do you see this, guys? It looks, if you can imagine, if you're used to the binomial, uh, you know, NCX, where X can be zero to N. Anyway, you may have forgotten your combinatorials, but think of it, if I just wrap it up in a shrink wrap, does it look a little bit like the bell curve, right? So these are binomial networks. And when the number of nodes is very high and the probability that any two nodes are connected is very low, then this degenerates into, uh, or the asympt asymptotic limit of this is a, something called a Poisson distribution. So generally mathematicians, when they hear the word binomial and Poisson, they get quite excited because uh, to their minds, it represents simplicity. Okay? Uh, it represents distributions that are uh, very well understood and studied, the binomial and the Poisson distributions. Okay? So this is the Parabasi graph. In this graph, if I were to do a degree distribution, you notice that you see that certain nodes have very high degree, you know, one, two, three, four, five, maybe six, seven. There are seven nodes which are of a very high degree out of a total of what? Out of a total of 207. So 3.5% nodes have very high degree. If you just look at this very dark uh, colored ones, there are only two of them. So two, three nodes are very high. So if you look at the degree distribution, you see, it, it has what is called a power law behavior, sort of it decays with, you see the reciprocal decay factor. So there's a little bit of a theory that Barabasi at one point observed and his student Albert, they observed that <coughs> these graphs, if you just shrink wrap it as a curve going down, they follow a rule of exponential decay, e to the minus, like k to the minus gamma. So where k is the degree, so it is like, I think, suppose the degree is, uh, let's say gamma is two. So, so K or degree or D, let's say, well, here I'm using D here. D to the minus two is the same as one over D square. Isn't it? So one over D square uh, is a reciprocal um, fast decaying function, isn't it? For example, gravitation, the force of gravitation or the is one over R squared, isn't it? The, the force of attraction between two bodies goes as one over R squared. So we know that we sun does attract us, but we are probably not under the influence of Andromeda or something like that, because it's too far away. So this is a reciprocal distribution. What it means is that there are certain very few nodes of extremely high uh, influence, like 40 or 42 yeah, degrees. Most nodes, have low degree because one square one one over one square is just one uh, and uh, it is much more than uh, so the probability that you'll see something like this is much higher than the probability that you'll see two to one over two square which is one fourth so you can literally see that these things sort of decay very very rapidly right? so <clears throat> that is People have been thinking about all this for quite some time, right? And then first what you do is you develop intuition by looking at these theoretical structures, right? Learn to distinguish a graph from other graphs uh, by understanding what sort of topologies and what sort of edge distributions you can see in practice. One basic rule in practice is that complete graphs are rare or highly connected graphs are rare. In real life, most of the graphs that you see, large graphs that you see, are extremely sparse. So, uh, for example, there is a theory, what is it called? Uh, somebody's Metcalf's law or something that used to drive Silicon Valley, in which people used to believe that all you need to do is uh, create, get N people into your network. When you have N people into your network and they collaborate with each other, 
there will be approximately n square connections, isn't it? I mean, if you think of n people, how many possible connections are there? n times n minus 1 over 2. That is, uh, n choose 2. That would be the number of interconnects between these two, the number of interconnects possible. And if the value is in the interconnection, then the more the people you bring, the faster, the faster or the more value you produce, and you have a hockey stick-like growth. For the longest time, companies uh, believe that. I mean, venture capitals just said, focus on growth, right? focus on acquiring the market or capturing the market and so forth. Though <clears throat> it takes a while, actually, or understanding of network, complex network dynamics to realize that dense networks in which everybody is connected to everybody is actually relatively low. Metcalfe's law, law still has value. Uh, the number of interconnects will still be quite high, but it won't be as high as predicted by the, the naive argument. Most real networks are rather sparse networks. So, for example, you're not connected to all the 3.5 billion people in Facebook. You're probably connected to a few hundred, or if you're a person like me, you're probably connected to barely three, four or five people. Who knows? I've never used Facebook much. So, uh, things like that. Right. So sparsity is a fundamental part of complex networks you see it far more often than you see the absence of sparsity means dense networks dense networks are only there in small networks usually very rarely in large complex networks <clears throat> so let's look at that and see if that statement that i made is true if you look at these points even in the enron graph you don't see all of the points interconnected in the center it's too dense but if you just look out here in this region, you can clearly see. Let's let's um, open. Can I open this image in a new save image as no? I can't open it in a new tab. All right, you can clearly see that not every edge is connected to every other edge. There, um, the number of connections is actually rare, and you can see it in the statistics. There are thirty-three thousand um, nodes. So if you look at 33,000 nodes, if you look at this, how many edges can potentially be there? The number of edges that can be there is 33 squared, which I presume is a huge number. And 33 is 0.3, 0.9, uh, 0.9. So yes, it is in the order of about 10 uh, million. 10 million uh, edges could possibly be there. But how many edges do we actually see? We see that there are about 180,000 edges. 180,000 edges is far less than 10 million, isn't it? So it is an example of a sparse graph. Not only that, we see something that the average degree of a node, like averaged over all the nodes, is 10.7. Right? So most nodes are connected by, on average, uh, 10 or 11 other um, so an employee is probably interacting or sending emails to 11 employees, give or take. Right? That is one way of looking at it. So uh, that, that speaks to the sparsity of this network. Likewise, if you look at the other illustrative net, uh, cat brain, cat brain is highly connected. So I wouldn't take that one. Look at the disease zone. Uh, if, you, if you look at this, once again, you'll notice that just because you have a disease doesn't mean that you'll get every other disease. That would be catastrophic, isn't it? So most disease, diseases are you know, linked to just a few other diseases because of genetic factors. So genetics, the same genes causing mischief. So this is, uh, I hope you guys can just visually see that this is a sparse network. And in the summary, it must be there. Let's go look at the summary of this graph if I print it out. Yes. It has 500 odd nodes, and they form only 1,100 edges. And the number of uh, degree, average degree, is just 4.6. So a node is connected to just four or five other nodes, which means that given a disease, uh, your likelihood of having uh, another disease or close to it, uh, just four or five other diseases you may have. Well, that itself is bad news, right? But um, still. Uh, better than thinking that if you have a disease, you'll get a lot of other diseases. But that's not always true. There are certain nodes which have extremely high degrees. So for example, we know that if you have metabolic disorder, 
when you have diabetes, it's likely that you'll have a whole host of other medical problems and so forth. Right? So just as an illustration of how things go. So this is so in other words, the degree of a node of is gives you local importance. And for the entire graph, the degree of the average degree gives you the level of connectivity in that graph. That is one measure. The second measure is the diameter of the graph. The diameter of the graph is quite literally this. Um, if you look at the path from any node to any other node in a fully con in a in a connected graph, you know that you can go from any node to any other node by traversing the right number of um, edges. So find the shortest path between two nodes, every pairwise, every pair of nodes, uh, N1, Ni, and Nj, find the shortest path, right? the shortest distances. Now, then the radio, the diameter of a graph is the biggest of the shortest path. Am I making myself clear? The biggest of the shortest path would be, or the shortest distances, or mathematicians just call it distance because when they ask of distance between two points, they invariably mean the shortest distance. So the the biggest shortest distance in the graph or the distance in the graph is the diameter of the graph. Are we together? So when we look at some of the illustrative networks, let's see what is the diameter of some of these graphs. Um, yeah, hang on. Hat brain. Uh, I mean, illustrative networks, networks, random geometric. I forgot which two, which of these files it was on. Maybe it was in Facebook itself. Uh, where is the Facebook network? Yeah. No. Okay. So the, the diameter is an important characteristic. If you have a star formation, you can imagine what is the diameter of a graph in a star formation? From any node to any other node, you can go in at most two steps. All you need to do is go to the center and from the center go to the other node. Wheel, it may be even less than two because the uh, other node may be your neighbor. Right? And so you can work out. In a complete graph, every node is connected to every other node. So the diameter is one. So that's how you think about networks. But if you look here in the friends network or social graph, you know that uh, you, are you can be many degrees apart. You can be as much as, uh, like there's the theory of six degrees of separation, which says that any two people can be connected by at most six edges. Though in practical terms, what happens is most people are connected to each other with less than six nodes, like typically three, four nodes. <coughs> and so leaving aside the fringe elements, the diameter of most social graphs, even large social graphs, is surprisingly small. Now, six looks surprisingly small to people. You can reach from anybody to anybody in six degrees of separation. But actually, in practical terms, it's lower than that. And you see that in Facebook, I mean, in LinkedIn. LinkedIn tells you uh, you are one step away, two step away, or whatever it is. And whosoever you search for will either be connected to you or is just two steps away. I don't know. Have you guys experienced that? Most people you can reach in just a couple of steps. So that speaks to that. Now, another property that is important to network graphs, and I'll add it to the note, is suppose you look at an ego network. I, uh, I have, let us say, 10 friends. Right? Now, are those friends really talking to each other or are they just talking to me? In other words, is it a star formation or there is a lot of link between my friends. They themselves are interconnected to each other. Are we together? That is a measure of something called the clustering coefficient. In other words, how cohesive is this group? How clustered is this group? Is measured by seeing what proportion of my friends are inter talking to each other. Now, you realize that if I have 10 friends, I can have 10 times 9 over 2, about uh, 45 Right, uh, 45 possible um, interconnections, edges between my friends. Right, but suppose I find only 
uh, instead of 45, I find that 10 edges are there. There are 10 relationships between my friends. So I would say that the cluster coefficient is 10 over 45 right, for that uh, for that particular node. Are we getting this, guys? It's very simple. Uh, you take a node and you find all its uh, neighbors, and then you see um, uh, how much, uh, how many edges exist between the neighbors, and compare to the, that to the maximum number of edges that could potentially exist. That ratio is called the clustering coefficient. So, in a star network, the clustering coefficient is zero. The only people everybody is talking to is the is the is the central guy, the hub, the ego. By the way, the people that are one node that you care for uh, connects to are called the alter egos. These are the alters, alters of the ego. Right. So the alters, if they don't talk to each other or they are not connected, it is a star formation. Yeah. It's a hub and spokes model. On the other hand, if all of them are talking to each other then this ego is nothing special you know everybody is connected with equal degree to everybody else <clears throat> fully connected to everybody else then you have a clique a clique is a small group of people who are all talking to each other and so what would be the cluster coefficient of the star right of the star network what would be the cluster coefficient anyone You guys there uh, zero zero excellent excellent yeah and what would be the cluster coefficient of a, <clears throat> a small cluster like a ego net network in which all of them are talking to each other see that network has achieved the maximum connectivity potential right is fully connected is fully clustered so the cluster coefficient is one and so that is something important that is another measure by which you look at it now you can again this is at the local level and you can take it at the global level you can ask what is the average cluster coefficient of the entire network right how much sort of interconnectivity exists locally in uh, averaged over everything in the network right Our locals you average over all the locals and so forth so that is the cluster coefficient right now these are all what are called dyadic measures you notice that we measured this or we came up with these numbers by just looking at the connection between two nodes recently and i think not maybe not just recently but uh, in in social sciences people have discovered that uh, what matters is not just the relationship between two people but actually relationship between three people right it's a it's a triad so they look for triangular uh, triangles in the graph. Yeah. These are often called the triads, and some people just call it triangles. So you can ask how many triangles are there in network. In real life network, you often find triangles. And when you look, when you see real life networks and the distribution of triangles and all that, they show even a more pronounced power law behavior, you know, reciprocal power law behavior. It's quite interesting that these things actually exist in networks. So that is something else we talk about. We measure the number of triangles present. Then there are many such measures. Uh, and then we can take the average of uh, the, the, the triangles and locally, globally, and so on and so forth. Then uh, what else can you observe about a network? So there are many, many such measures. I, can go, I could go on, actually. Uh, not perhaps, because at this moment, for some reason, some of them are escaping me. Let me think what else you can do. So as if you're, I think, you're not sharing. Um, One second, right? I'm not sharing? It is there, but we can't see the... Oh, okay, it is there. there. Yeah. Right, yeah. Okay. So this is great. So let me just take this Facebook one and go through it. So you notice that uh, degree distribution is very pronounced. It's, it's that power law behavior that we saw. Yes, one more thing that you do is you search for communities in network. So you know that people, social, like it's hardly needs to be said. In social network, there are communities. Uh, we all form our little communities, our photography clubs, our, uh, you know, uh, clubs based on certain hobbies, certain uh, socioeconomic background and whatnot, yeah. professional uh, background, so forth. So you can search for these clusters or these communities in graphs. 
And there are quite a few algorithms that find communities in tags. This is one of the greedy algorithms, Lovain's algorithm, uh, which is fairly fast. It quick discovers relatively fast the communities in a graph. Community detection, very much like clustering in data, is a pretty slow process. It's a computationally intensive process. And so when you run it on your this these labs, when you do on your local uh, laptop, uh, it will take a long time. What I would highly suggest is instead go to Google, uh, create a notebook there. Google in the AI services, they give you notebooks and uh, pick a VM that is powerful enough and do it there. Uh, for this thing, because you're not using the GPU, uh, so just take a CPU node. CPU nodes are much less expensive than GPU nodes, but take a CPU, a powerful CPU node and just run it on that. So it will run a bit faster and it will actually finish. So network computations are notoriously slow. So just be aware of it. Be patient. Like, for example, uh, here you notice that I'm still computing uh, some of these things, which God knows when they will finish. Oh, here it is. Oh, the degree distribution came through. Uh, this is the degree distribution of uh, uh, nodes in the Enron graph. You see it. And does it show a power law behavior? Oh, extremely, this power law behavior is extreme here. Do you see that? Most things have just one or two or three connections. Most people are uh, connected to only a few people. And some people are connected to a lot of other people. Right? There's a degree distribution. Now, you notice that the community detection is still running. And I would imagine that this community detection will go on for a very long time before it finishes. I'm a bit surprised that the degree distribution, the big degrees are somewhere here. Interesting, but anyway, let me save this image. Um, all right, and the degree distribution also is here. Okay, so these computations take a long time and then the definition. So we can talk about, just to recapitulate, we can talk about or triads, we can talk about these global properties, we can look for communities. Communities are more coarse grain structures, you know. They give you sort of a topological feel for the network. How it how does it look? And it matters, by the way, um, how it looks, what communities exist, and so forth. So there was one uh, example, was it Dutch? I think it was the Dutch Denmark. Denmark, they studied the people who is calling home on the cell phone or who is talking to whom. And the, any country would like to be um, uh, sort of a well-mixed country where all the different types of people, different ethnic backgrounds are talking to each other. The, you, the last thing you want is a country in which you have division. One, one group doesn't talk to the other group and one group speaks one language, the other group speaks another language. I believe in the case of Denmark, and, and I might get the country wrong, there were they studied because the country was bilingual. There were two languages, I believe. Uh, Dutch must be one and French the other or something like that. I forget what. Uh, and to their great surprise, despite the belief, I mean, maybe not great surprise, but to some people's um, surprise, even though the Denmark are considered a very progressive and mixed society, Nonetheless, when they studied the network of communications, they found that the network divides naturally into two communities uh, and they are separated by linguistic boundary. Right? Likewise, uh, another interesting uh, case is, and the, uh, that one case, I don't know if I can speak, maybe I can. So in the Ivory Coast of uh, Africa, they were, as you know, those are politically very unstable situations. So actually a researcher that I happen to know, a student of my professor, uh, and who's himself now a professor, but I think I'll avoid names, uh, was studying that and uh, observed something quite interesting. The com there were communities, the people of one, they were like, you know, one set of people were calling each other, another set of people were calling each other. And there were well-defined uh, clusters or communities. And the thing is, uh, it was almost a clear indication that there is a pro-government and a rebel group politically. And there was some insurgency in progress or that is, that is likely to erupt and things like that. So people study this. There's a, there's a very lot of practical value in studying networks, especially evolving networks that are there. 
The third thing we do with networks are study not so much the degree of a network, but which network, which nodes are critical to the network. So for example, let us say that uh, if you think about it, the Bay Bridge, and if you say that there are, uh, the, if you want to go from a business in Peninsula to a business in uh, Emeryville or Oakland or Berkeley, you realize that the bridge is a choke point. You have to cross the bridge. If you think of the bridge as an edge between the two sides, it is essentially like a high traffic or very critical edge. You take out the bridge and a lot of uh, traffic will come to a halt right, in a traffic pattern study. Do you see that, guys? It's pretty, it is almost self evident. We all live in Bay Area. We know that the bridges are choke points and they are critical resources. So, when you study a network, you can often discover uh, these edges that act like bridges, such that a lot of flow, if you imagine that there is information flowing across all the edges, right? Uh, think of edges as flow networks you will realize that certain edges, they act like bridges and they have a lot of flow through them. Right? And so there is a measure for that. You can measure how important each of those is. And why is that relevant? Because those are now your strategic assets. You better make sure that they are well protected. And you can study then the vulnerability of a network by saying, what happens if we take off this edge? Right? What will be the consequence? So one classic example was, on the northeast power grid at one point suddenly one particular substation failed it let because it was connected to another substation that the load the electricity load automatically got, got diverted to the neighboring one but that was already running critical there was way too much flow there and it was running electricity flowing and it triggered that circuit breaker to go off well now there are two networks are uh, two substations down now and now all the traffic, all the flow of electricity that would have come from these substations are now going through other substations, which all get overloaded with flow, right? current flow. And so it led to cascading failures. And literally, it, it was like a, a fall of the dominoes. Before you know it, the eastern seaboard had gone dark significantly. Right? It was a, the electrical situation was hugely impaired. So that is an example of what, why it is critical to study networks. <coughs> so that is it about networks, guys. Uh, anything else? Any questions? So can we like use it in like our HR scenario? Like, so if you want to use this network in the HR, how, like what are some use cases for that? Aha, you know that I'm in the HR talent space. <laughs> Talent can be one, but um, other than talent, like yeah. like for so, enterprise. Talent is the new name for HR. I mean, okay, people, all the other functions of HR, they usually call talent these days. I don't know why, but maybe uh, they do. Uh, but yeah, HR, in the broad field of HR, yes, you know, there's a lot of uh, networking that you can apply. So for example, when people get hired, right? And if you look at who the hiring manager is and who is getting hired, Often you notice that companies have a culture. They tend to hire much more from some universities than from other. Right? And sometimes amongst the people who get hired, you find that there's a commonality in the sense that they belong to the same research group because the company is doing work in that research group. You can discover a lot of patterns like that. If you study the employee network, you can see cliques forming. Right? You can see the influencers in the in the company, you can see all that. There, there's a huge privacy aspect though. It's not so easy to study internal networks, uh, partly because from a security perspective, perhaps people are doing it, but uh, from a HR perspective, the HIPAA privacy laws and the GDPR, and there are many, many privacy laws, SOC 1, SOC 2 compliance and so forth, uh, that uh, prevent you from studying. So for example, you can't study people's emails. Of course, that is a complete no-no, right? Now, uh, even though the companies make you sign all sorts of uh, at the time of employment that it is their email and if they want, they can read it and so forth. Generally, they tend not to do that uh, as far as I know. But uh, can they study the metadata? Can they say who is interacting with who? 
Uh, possibly they can, but is that a privacy violation or not? A lot of privacy experts believe that that is a huge privacy violation because a lot can be inferred simply from the metadata. You can make a graph of all of these and you can tell a lot of things that are happening. So the answer certainly is yes, you can do it, but you have to do it within the framework of the uh, of the privacy laws of the land. But if you draw it out, it, it does become evident that um, what is going to happen quite often becomes evident. So network theory is a uh, network science is one of the fastest growing areas these days. If you look at the Google trend, and I'm not terribly good, let's do an experiment. How do we go to the Google trend? We just go to Google trend, isn't it? Google trends. What happens? Google trends. Let's do this. Interest over time. Oh, this doesn't seem, sound too good. It is the opposite of what I was trying, what I was hoping that it would show surprising. Okay, I learned something. Um, how do I go back? Network science, uh, complex works over time. Oh, art and sciences, no. Actually, I'm not able to look at it, online communities. Yeah, I'm not searching for the right word, network analysis. Maybe this would do it. The interest has been rising over the years. Um, the number of uh, trends for network science, maybe somebody else has network science of teams. Computational and uh, what are the research? Well, I'm not able to uh, get the trend data. Uh, I'm not very good with this. But generally, it is believed that this is one of the very hot areas of growth. Uh, in, in data science. So it's certainly worth, really worth knowing. Right? And there is a, a vast amount of resources. I would, in these notes, uh, I will give, like for example, if you look at my notes, where is my notes? Are you guys seeing my entire screen or just one window? Do you guys, are you seeing my whole screen or just one window? I think that's whole screen. Uh, whole screen. Whole screen, I think, yeah. What I've done is I'm still not quite done with the chapter. You'll see a lot of Latin paragraphs. But for what it is worth, let me just show you what I'm doing. The idea is that in this chapter, I'll use it as a short introduction to networks. Uh, the first part explains what are the standard network topologies, like, for example, these different topologies, complete network, et cetera, et cetera. The trees, hierarchical trees, and this and that. And then I talk about the various models of networks, the, like, for example, the Erdos Ringi model, the Barabasi Albert model, and then there are more models now, and the small worlds model, and so on and so forth, the home model. So I talk about that to give you a background on how to think about networks. Next, I mention the measures of a network. A very simple measure, number of nodes, number of edges. The degree of connectivity, you know, how complete is the network, then uh, things, things like that, and centralities, uh, then like uh, dig, the degree distributions, then the clustering coefficient, I talk about the triangles, what proportion of triangles exist. Right? Uh, we talk about this critical, you know, those uh, strategic nodes, how many of those are, how, the modularity measures and so forth. Then the community. So I explain all of these concepts so that whenever you encounter a network, you have a framework to think about it with, right? So where you can explore and work with that. Now, this is obviously a chapter on exploratory data analysis. So I don't go, it is just preparatory to machine learning. We don't, I don't give the deep neural network aspect of it because that will come later. In the beginning, as you know, uh, this, uh, a lot of it has been exploratory aspects. 
And exploratory aspects are very important. You can't really do much machine learning unless you understand the data really thoroughly. So this is for networks. And uh, you see this <coughs> random networks, geometric networks, and so forth. This is the, by the way, the power law distribution, the PD is equal to D to the minus gamma. <coughs> I still need to fill in the theory. I'll fill in the theory. And that's about it. Pretty much it would be whatever I've explained in the lecture. Its main purpose is that hereafter, whenever you see networks, or you get data. Whenever you see an adjacency matrix, for example, networks are everywhere. You, for example, can take 10 people, right? And if they, if they bought a book in common, 100 people, if they, they have been shopping in Amazon or 1,000 people, you can tell if two people have watched, uh, seen, uh, bought the same book, there is an edge between them. You look at the movie lens database. What do you get there? Uh, X has watched this movie and given this rating. Y has watched this movie and given this rating. Right? If nothing else, X and Y are connected because they have a shared movie that they have watched. Isn't it? So networks are all around us, and a study of the network is very productive. So with that, I'll stop, guys, about network, and I'll stop for today's session. So uh, Asif, sir, one question. So is there a book we can refer on this? Oh, yes, very much so. So in this, I've given the reference. By the way, the references are pretty. Uh, if you look at my notes, no? oh, because I, at this moment, suppress them. Let me, uh, if you have the latest version of the book, you, you, the, my notes, you'll see it. Give me one moment. Let me, uh, in the interest of uh, compiling this code fast, I was, I had hidden a lot of these chapters. Let me bring it back. Give me a second. So you notice that in the further reading, I've mentioned all of this. I'll just mention it in much greater detail. The best books. Three books are very good. One of them is from a practical perspective. It talks about the network X API in Python. Very good, very, very good book to get started with. Yeah. There is another book which talks about, which is an online book rather, PDF, which is about iGraph, which what you use in R to do. Python also you can use iGraph, but most people are moving to network and network kit. Um, so does that. Then there are two textbooks. One of them is the Barabasis textbook. It has just come out, beautifully laid out, very nice. And the other is a great classic by Newman, which just had a second edition. You can tell these are very good books. But if I have to, and I'll give you notes, I'll explain what you should start with. I would say that start with this book, the Network CNA. Then the original papers of Ardos and the uh, paper on Barabasi. And then uh, there is another guy called Barabas or, or something. Um, a great mathematician. Uh, these three papers are also really worth looking at, and I'll mention that. Uh, also, this repository, you see this network repository? It is a repository of all uh, network data. I mean, not all, I would say, that's an exaggeration. Some really good network data. So, uh, network repository. If you go to network repository, this website, you will, it's quite nice actually. You can go into, what can you go into, for example? Let's go into biological networks or animal social networks. Well, it turns out animals also have their own social networks. Right? So the, let's take something that would be interesting. Yeah. Well, they are the songbirds. There are 110 songbirds and they have a thousand connections. Let's see, how do they talk to each other? Right. Uh, Look at the network. Ah, do you see this? Guys, do you see this? On this web website, you can go and visualize all of these networks in a very nice way. So you can see that there are two songbirds which are standing apart. Then there are two big clusters of songbirds. So how many, if you talk in terms of community detection, how many communities would you detect here? Uh, two. Right, and then this load tiny little community here. So things like that, you know, uh, it is very useful to be able to do that. 
than to be able to, for example, let's take any other network. Now you saw that one. Let's compare that with the Sparrows network and see how Sparrows deal with things. Oh, what do you notice with Sparrows? They seem to be highly interconnected, isn't it, guys? And if you know Sparrows, you know that they all stay in flocks. This seems much more sort of a descriptive of a Sparrows network. Then let's go back and look at some other networks instead of just animal networks. Let's look at uh, citation. People cite each other's work in the research journals. How does the citation look? Well, I was a high energy physicist. Let's go and look into my field. Somewhere, I hope my paper is also referred to. Oh, sorry, this crashed. Um, where is it? Yeah, look at this. Do you guys see these networks? So it, doesn't it make you ask, who is this guy who's so highly referred to? They have, there are 496 references to this paper, isn't it? Right. So there are certain uh, things which are highly referred to. And you can zoom into this. It's a very good place. You should go and look into it. <laughs> How does the underlying data look like for this? Like, a, like does data need to be in a certain format or like? Yes. So there format. are many formats for the data. The simplest is just an edge list. Okay. List of edges. <laughs> for example, here, they actually give you a preview of the data. Here it is. Uh, wait for it. It's loading the data. It will show a preview in a minute. Yeah. Do you notice? It's just a connection of the first is connected to this, this node, this node, this node. Pairs. Each row is a pair. Oh, okay. Right. It is an edge list. That is one format. It may exist in the <coughs> as an adjacency matrix. It may exist as many things. Right. So some of it I'll talk about in the notes to do. But see, <coughs> with the examples that I've given you, get started playing with networks. So you've seen it. All the networks are different from each other. So collaboration network is very important. If you look at the collaboration networks, you find something quite interesting. Let's look at this astrophysics network. Do you notice the clustering of groups of people who are clustered and who are together collaborating and lot of collaborators. You can see who are the people <clears throat> everybody wants to collaborate with. You know, people with high degrees. You see it, guys. They literally look, I mean, uh, in a very literal sense, they are the stars. They, they look like stars, you know, with so many people connected to them. So that is it. You know, all these networks are beautiful and you can spend a lot of time actually um, studying this. Road networks, yeah, this was the thing I was talking about, the road networks. Let's look at the roads and where should we look at? <clears throat> US roads. And it's a pretty big graph, I would imagine. So this one is this is the road network in US. Can you make out the big interstates? You know, long chains, daisy chains of links. Obviously, this is not the best representation of the road network, but you can see the road networks here. Let me, people retweet, you know, something goes viral and people retweet. Let's look at the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson when it was discovered, the so-called God particle, how, <clears throat> what was the cluster of retweeting? People retweeting about it. You see that, right? Huge degree of interest when the Higgs boson was discovered. And uh, this is how the retweets looked like. So there is a lot of structure in there in these networks that you can study. It's, you have to start somewhere, and I hope today was a good start. Right? Uh, <clears throat> so if you were to look at this graph, 
Uh, how many communities do you see here, guys? Obviously. Three. Yeah, they, they just st stares out at you. <coughs> so this is it, actually. I'd like to maybe add this to our uh, Aves Wild Bird Network. Let's take this. Let me take this. I'll add it to your notebook because it looks really pretty here. Uh, uh, are there any examples for uh, uh, you know, IT infrastructure or uh, site reliability? Oh, yes, very, very much. So, for example, when you look at all that, like the traffic flow, right, the network traffic flow and internet flow, and so forth, very well studied. And you can tell a lot about it. You can tell about the vulnerability in networks. In the network internal network traffic patterns, see data flows from server to server, right? Yeah. You can do you can do threat. I mean, uh, a failure, uh, you know, prediction and a lot of things. Uh, sometimes you realize that a network is at critical point. If you take out one node, it will lead to cascading failures. Right? Think about it. You're doing a big data computation, right? You're, you're running the nodes at pretty high load. What will happen if one of the node fails? All the, now, big data will automatically route traffic to other nodes, you know, the jobs to other nodes. Right? Uh, then <clears throat> those other nodes will get uh, overloaded. Let us say that you are not careful. What will start happening? They will start having out of memory errors and things like that. Yeah. So suppose your scheduling algorithm is not robust. They'll start failing. And quite often, there are bugs and there are things like that happen. So you'll start seeing uh, suddenly a lot of things go down. And if you have managed big data clusters, you notice that that one machine going down usually is bad news. It means that more will go down when there is very, very high load on the uh, computational load on the system. So your network, uh, uh, making networks of them and studying what is happening and what are the points of vulnerability is very important. Sometimes what happens, people say I have a lot of machines, but if you look carefully, you realize that one machine is the hub. A few machines are the hub. They are taking extraordinary amount of traffic and load. And there are many other machines which are hardly taking any traffic. So there is an asymmetric distribution of workloads and flow of data. So if you can identify those, you can make a huge difference. So that's the way I would say that, Jay. Anything else, Gil? Okay, sir. All right, so I'll pause the recording here.